And the other thing that happened to me was that when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in my spirit lifted me into a realm which I had never known before. The realm of evil spirits. And uh, you know the Bible says we wrestle with not with flesh and blood but with demons. Before that time if I met a demon person, possessed person and I wouldn't know what to do. I'd just avoid it and go somewhere else. It's like that preacher who didn't know how to cast out demons. And the demon possessed person in a meeting <laughs> He said, well, I can't cast out the demon, but I can cast you out, so the demon will go with you. So he called the ushers to take the fellow out of the way. And that's the Old Testament way. Get rid of the Canaanites because their demon possessed, kill them, or throw them out of the meeting. But the New Testament way is not that. It's not throw the fellow out or kill him, cast the demon out. That's how Jesus did it. So then I realized that that the Lord's given me authority over demons. And I've had numerous encounters with demons since then. But in every single case I discovered that a demon would listen to one sentence of mine immediately. If I came in the name of Jesus and my heart was clean. That's very important. If you got bitterness in your heart, don't drive out our demons. Because the demon would say, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who do you think you are? But I found this, you know, once I remember, I was in a Bible school. And I just finished giving the message from this pulpit, and there's a long rows of students sitting there. And I said, okay, I finished the message, let's pray. And everybody was quiet, and all of a sudden, from the last seat, one of the students jumped up and began to dance. He didn't make a noise, but I said, this looks like the devil disrupting the meeting. So I didn't want to raise my voice. He was about 40 feet away. Because everybody whose heads were bowed would suddenly get distracted. It's the right time the devil wants to distract a service is when we are bowed for prayer. So I turned away from the mic and I whispered in a way that the people sitting behind me on the platform would not hear. Quietly. In Jesus' name, sit down there. He sat up. The front row wouldn't have heard me. There he heard me sat down. Six months later, I got a letter. I never met this boy afterwards. I never met any of them. I just went off after the meeting. Six months later, I get this letter from Mauritius, which is an island in the Indian Ocean. He says, Dear Brother Zach, you don't know me, you've never met me. But I'm the student who was sitting there in the back row. And he told me to sit down. I said, Wow. That's the day I discovered that the devil has got good hearing. <laughs> I discovered that I don't have to be like these Pentecostals who shout and yell and scream at demons. I'm very thankful I heard that. Learned to that day that all this yelling and gee, that was a dignity about Jesus. He never yelled and screamed at demons. Whenever people yell and scream, it's because they're not too sure. You know how you shout when you're afraid? It's like that. <laughs> but if you're sure of yourself, you don't shout. Jesus never shouted. He never yelled and screamed. But that's one of the first things the Lord had to teach me: authority over sin. And I remember another time. This was in CFC when we were having a conference and I was just about to begin the afternoon Bible study. We had rows of chairs and an aisle there and an aisle there. And way at the back I saw, I couldn't see what was there, but everybody was looking down at the aisle. I thought, what is this, some child crawling there or something? I couldn't see because there's a row of chairs. And all of a sudden I saw a man crawling like a snake <laughs> coming up to the front. So I'm not going to let the devil disrupt the Bible study. I said, in Jesus' name, just lie down there. He went to sleep immediately. He said, okay, let's continue with our Bible study. And he was just lying there and the rest of us. We continued the Bible study for one hour. And he said, let's pray. Amen. And he woke up. As soon as we said, Amen, he woke up. And then we could counsel him. 
I remember another time. <clears throat> Again, it was a CFC meeting. We used to have Sunday evening meetings in those days, and I was standing up in front. We were all closing our eyes for the closing of prayer. And my eyes were closed, and this guy comes and taps me. He was a nominal Christian whom I knew before who had come. And he had a knife in his hand. He said, um, he said, I'm on my way to murder someone. He said, okay, you wait, let's pray first. <laughs> 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 So I said, you sit there, I'll come. <laughs> and we finished prayer. And then I said, okay, now what do you want? He said, there's somebody I hate so much and I'm going to on my way to kill him. I said, okay, before you do that, let me talk to you. And I said, um, you know, he knew all about the gospel. He was an armed Christian. I had spoken to him before. I said, I want you to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. He shouted out with all the people hearing. Media just finished. Jesus Christ is not Lord. I didn't think he had a demon. I thought he was just a murderer. <laughs> I said, a demon. I said, you're a liar. Not to him, but to the demon. Get out of him right now in Jesus' name. And he took a karate position and just slid to the floor like a snake. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. <laughs> and I picked him up and I said, say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I said, Jesus Christ is Lord. He said, oh, this headache is gone. I'm free. I'm sure he didn't murder anybody after that. <laughs> but, you know, the sad thing is he now expected me to make a big issue of the fact that he was the demon was cast out and wanted to give a testimony and I said no. We don't make a big issue of this. We have proclaimed for years in this church the devil's being defeated. But we're not going to give prominence to people who are delivered from demons. We preach about being free from sin. So we're not going to make much of you. So he left the church. He went to some other church where they would get him to give his testimony and make a big issue that the demon was cast out of him. So many things like this I discovered. I could tell you many more stories, but uh, the authority we have is so important in the ministry to our spiritual authority. Authority over influencing government decisions. To be the light of the world means the prince of darkness, that Satan, must recognize that you're light. And like the light drives out darkness. It's not a struggle when you switch on this light. It's not a struggle for it to slowly drive the darkness out. You know that. Like that, the darkness goes. That's the authority we have for Satan and all his power. He cannot touch us. You need to recognize that just like darkness goes out of a room the moment you put on a switch, it's not a slow movement. No. It's immediate. It's very, very important. It's not slow, it's immediate. That we have authority in, our, in prayer and authority also, you know, when the Bible says that we have to be a light to the nations. It's not trying to take over the country and uh, like the Marxists, Christianity is not communism. We're not trying to take over the government. We influence the government by prayer. And that's the other thing I began to discover through the ministry of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know how the Bible says your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I saw visions and I had dreams. They're meaningful. I mean, we have a lot of meaningless dreams which just because we ate too much at night. And all kinds of crazy things we see which mean nothing. Sometimes I have things like that too. But I had some, a few meaningful dreams which are really from God. Warning me about certain things in relation to the church and the ministry. And um, about 37 years ago, 
we had gone to the north of India for some ministry and about 2 30 in the morning I had a vision. I saw the face of one of India's cabinet ministers. He was in charge of the whole ministry. And I saw a number of faces of various Indian people. And I heard a word that said, the power to free these people is in the church. That's all. It was all. So I didn't know what it meant, but I knew. And this face was very clear, this cabinet minister, and I had to do something about it. I didn't know what I was supposed to pray concerning him. But I mentioned his name, and I prayed in tongues, when I didn't know what else to pray. I came back to Bangalore in the south where I live. I shared with this with the church. And I said, brothers and sisters, I don't know what this vision is, but this is what I got and I've been praying in tongues and those of you who have the gift you can pray with me in tongues. I'm not, I don't belong to any political party because they're all corrupt one way or the other. But I said I believe that the church must influence the government without being belonging to any political party. So I said let's just pray. And very soon, first of all he became sick and then he had to leave uh, the party and then a month later he resigned from his cabinet post and I knew something was happening and a sharp he was a leader of one section of that party and so there came a deep division in that political party they were divided became two groups which were one till then and uh, every now and then people would try to unite the party together and be in the newspapers and immediately a burden would come to me to pray against it. So I pray against it. Even though I'm not a political person, I wasn't on the side of the opposition party either. But somehow I had this burden, these two shouldn't come together. I didn't know why. So they never came together. About eight months later, one of the members in parliament in India, this is 1977, I think, December, uh, raised a bill in Parliament which he wanted to make an act that there should be no more conversion to Christianity in India. We must pass a law. All conversion must be forbidden. People must stick to their religions. And they put it to the vote, but because of this deep division in the party, it could not be passed. And it's never been passed at any time from then till today. In one or two states they have passed it, but never in the whole country. Then I knew why God had given me that vision eight months earlier. To influence the government to protect the possibility of converting people to Christ in India. Little things. This, this didn't make the headlines in the newspapers, and in fact, I didn't want it to be the headlines. Uh, because I was not on this side or that side, I was on the Lord's side. And we had another experience where, in Bangalore, where all the government factories, you know, a lot of Indians, India's factories are not privately owned. India is socialist in those days, it's becoming a little more capitalistic now. But in the 70s, India was very socialist. They had patterned themselves after Soviet Russia. And so almost all of the big factories and industries were owned by the government. And all the factories in Bangalore went on strike. It never happened before, never happened since. And everybody went on strike for, you know, things that people go on strike for, more pay or whatever it is. And it became so bad that it went on for weeks on end. People had to send their families home because they didn't have money to keep them. And then on one day there was a police firing. I think some people were killed or something. And that, now Bangalore was like a gunpowder keg ready to be blown up when that happens. We called a three-day prayer meeting in our church and said, I said, the police can round up all the gangsters and the people who create problems, but they can't touch the evil spirits who are behind all these evil activities. That's our job. We are a church in Bangalore. We got to bind the activities of these evil spirits who create this 
violence. So we called three evenings of prayer. And on the third evening we felt God had answered our prayer service and that's it. And sure enough, the strike subsided and one of the one of our members when they went back to work the factories opened. The security guard at the gate told this person, we were living in such fear after things had got so bad, but on this particular date, I don't remember what it was, it was some particular date, suddenly things changed. So we knew that was the last day of our three-day prayer meeting. It was like God confirming to us that we could exercise authority in the city. It's amazing. You know, things that are written in scripture, it's a wonderful thing when we begin to experience it. It produces faith in our, in the younger generation. Our children grew up seeing all this when they were little boys and girls in our church. And my own children saw things happening in our home. Demons being cast out. It strengthens their faith. They realize that Christianity is not just a doctrine or a theory, but it's real. The first century Christianity is the same as 20th century, 21st century Christianity. It's the same thing. And that we can trust God just as much today as they could then. They were persecuted then and we would be persecuted today too. They lost their lives then. Peter was beheaded. Paul crucified. Paul was beheaded. We may face that in India too. We're prepared for that. But we want to demonstrate New Testament Christianity. And it's impossible to demonstrate that in any country if you don't have the same power that the apostles had on the day of Pentecost. And that's why the devil has made the doctrine of the Holy Spirit the most controversial doctrine in Christendom. Some on one fanatic extreme and some saying we don't want any of that. And I say both are wrong. Let's look at Jesus and the apostles as an example. So one of the things that the Lord gave me as a Bible teacher to give us a test to people to find out whether something is of the Spirit. You know, some people scare you by saying, oh, don't speak against that. That is the Holy Spirit, those people being falling down on the platform and doing all types of stupid things, some barking like dogs and saying it's the Holy Spirit. And I'm speaking against it, the Holy Spirit works in strange, mysterious ways. And uh, the day of Pentecost, they were like drunk people, so these people are also acting drunk. I don't believe all that. Jesus never acted like a drunk person. There's some people lying on the floor laughing, saying it's the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. So I said, the way to test everything is the Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, don't believe every spirit. It's one of the most needed words for us today. 1 John in chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. I'm not against the Pentecostals or Charismatics. There are some wonderful brothers among them and I love them deeply. But a lot of their teaching I am 100% against because it's not the Holy Spirit. I don't mind saying that publicly. There is the genuine and the counterfeit just mixed up. See, I saw this video recently of a conference of the biggest Pentecostal church in Australia, Hillsong. And I saw a four minute clip of the pastor, the chief pastor. And this is what he said. I can give you the link if you like. The Muslims and us worship the same God. We worship Abba. Allah is enough for me. His song is the one that has got so many songs. I presume they sing it to Jesus and to Allah. Where is Christianity going? What shall we say? Oh, 
don't speak against the Holy Spirit? Do not be forgiven? No. I say test every spirit. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For there are many false prophets come out into the world. And Jesus said the false prophets will cast out demons in his name, will heal the sick in his name, will prophesy in his name, and the Lord will say to them in the final day, I never knew you. Get away from here. That doesn't mean I'm against the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm against the counterfeit. A good seller of diamonds <laughs> will reject every counterfeit. But he'll have real diamonds in his store. So, we should be against the fake, definitely. Haven't you met people who claim to be born again who are fake? I met lots of people who claim to be born again. They don't know the Lord at all. I don't therefore throw out being born again. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Keep the baby and throw the bathwater out. Yes, there are lots of people who say they are born again who are not born again. But there is an experience of being born again. I know it. Likewise being filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is the test I've given to people. Fourfold test. You must know the New Testament. Otherwise you can't apply this fourfold test. You must read the New Testament carefully. Study it. Then you can apply this fourfold test to every manifestation that you see or everything that you hear preached. Number one, did Jesus do that? Did Jesus lie on the ground and laugh? Did he push people down? I find him lifting people up, not pushing people down. When you do the opposite of what Jesus does, Jesus lifted people up and these people pushed people down. You know there's a word in the Bible for doing the opposite of what Jesus did? Antichrist, that's right. Antichrist. Christ lifts people up and these people push people down. And he's like this. So number one, did Jesus do it? If he didn't do it, I'm not interested. Second, did Jesus teach it? Is there any verse, anything where Jesus taught that we should do that? Okay. Third test, did the apostles do it? Did the apostles push anybody down or did they lift them up? Did the apostles lie down on the floor and kick their legs like little babies and laugh hysterically? No. And number four, did the apostles teach it? It's very simple. Did Jesus do it? Did he teach it? Did the apostles do it? Did the apostles teach it? And if it fails on all four counts, I have taught people, reject it. If it is of God, at least one of these four it should pass. And so, you know what I mean. There are mistakes that the apostles did, but they are identified as mistakes. People can, people can take what I say and misquote it. Paul shaved his head so everybody should go and shave their head, the apostles did it. But that is one of the stupid things Paul did. You know, I mention that because a lot of people misquote me. I remember one saying, Oh Lord, these people take some sentence of mine and go and misquote it. And the Lord said to me, Don't worry, they misquoted me for 2,000 years. So <laughs> <laughs> then I was addressed. I spoke to you. Okay, people will misquote Jesus, they'll misquote you, but you know what I mean. The way to identify is. Jesus, did he ever do it and teach it? And a spirit-filled apostle, and he was filled with the spirit, did he write it or teach it or do it? It's the way to detect all the false things going on in the earth today. Why has God allowed so much of counterfeit? Why has he allowed so much of deception? I believe it is to make us more discerning. That our discernment doesn't come by the rule book, but by we are more dependent on the Holy Spirit. See 1 John chapter 2. It says here, verse 27, 1 John 2, 27, The anointing which you receive from Him abides in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. See that? It doesn't mean you don't need teachers. Teachers are there, there to explain the Bible. But you don't need, when you see something, you don't need somebody to come and tell you that's wrong. 
the anointing will teach you. You know, you listen to a preacher, maybe you're not a great theologian, I've had new believers, new believers, tell me that they listen to a, one of these false teachers using the Bible, and they said to me, Brother Zach, when I heard him, I felt there's something wrong about this man. I, I couldn't explain it because I don't know the Bible well, he said, but I sensed there was something wrong. I said, that's right, that was the Holy Spirit in you telling you, be careful, this guy's not genuine. So that's what this verse is about. You don't need anybody to sit down there next to you and say, don't listen to him. The Spirit of God will tell you there's something fake about this person. Listen to that voice and you'll never go astray. That anointing will teach you and you abide in Him. And particularly in relation to the last days, verse 28, little children, abide in Him like that because He's going to appear soon. And when He appears, you must have confidence in Him and not shrink away. Is it possible that some little children of God are going to shrink away because they got taken up with all these side issues instead of being focused on the central issue of Christianity which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. As a young Christian when I didn't know much way back 50, more than 50 years ago and there were all these different groups I found. I came from an Orthodox church, sprinkled as a baby, praying to Mary, praying for the dead, all that type of stuff, or what went on in that church. And I came out from there, and I saw all these groups in Christianity, everybody holding a Bible and saying, we've got the truth. The Jehovah's Witness said, we have the truth, and the Methodists said they have the truth, and the Roman Catholics said they have the truth, and the Baptists said they have the truth, the Pentecostals said they have the truth, the Brethren said they have the truth. Here I am, confused by all these people. I was reminded of that story where somebody in some country in Africa, they started a church called the Church of Christ, and that had a split. And down the street, just down the same street, they started another church called the True Church of Christ. Now you have Church of Christ. <laughs> and the True Church of Christ had a split. <laughs> a little further down the road, they started another church called the Only True Church of Christ. <laughs> Church of Christ, the true Church of Christ, the only true Church of Christ, the man walking down the street says, which one should I go to? <laughs> it's absolutely tragic. <laughs> but remember, this is what a lot of people are... I'll tell you what actually happened in one of our Hindu villages in India. In that particular village, there was only one dead Christian church. Thoroughly dead. You know, like some of these dead denomination churches. Where people are always fighting with each other and it was well known in the village. In a little village everybody knows what everybody has to do. Some people went into that village and preached the gospel and then one Hindu man was converted. And the next question he asked was, this person who brought him to the Lord, now that I have become a Christian, do I have to go to this church where they always fight with each other? What answer do you give? There's no other church. This is the tragedy. New converts, confused. We have to repent. Say, Lord, not, you're not to blame for that church. But if God has called you to be a part of a pure church in your locality, and you're not willing to pay the price for it, you're being diplomatic and doing this, that, and the other. You're answerable to God if you stumble some young people in your area. It's not enough just to get a reputation that I've reached holiness. Jesus did not come to produce a bunch of holy people. He came to build local expressions of his body. Of people who are totally committed to one another. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. When, when we had a family, my wife and I and our four children, they were with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They never had any other home. That was the only home they knew. That's the church. And we find exactly the same as the church we build today. It's a family. We belong to one another. We're committed to one another. 
that's the type of body that Christ is building and it's not Bible study groups. Let me tell you that. God bless the Bible study groups, but that's God's second best. I can't be against it, because it's better than nothing. But I want to tell you that's not God's highest. A lot of compromises and diplomats who build that. No, it's Christ is building the church. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church. He will prevail against all the Bible study groups, but he won't prevail against the church. The church is the only thing I'm interested in building. Like Noah was only interested in building the ark. He didn't have time for anything else. And you see, uh, you say, well, how can I do it? I'm not qualified. Well, I'll tell you what, what you need to do. You first go to God and confess every known sin in your life. Everything that you know to be sin, that's the first step. Then forgive everybody whom you have forgiven, who has hurt you, that you remember. You don't have to dig up your memory, just you know, whatever come, the little order bring to your mind. If you're not forgiven, some, some bitterness against your parents who didn't treat you properly or some uncle who molested you or some relative who took advantage of you or some boss who fired you or somebody cheated you. Just forgive them. Just like Jesus forgave you. 100%. And say, Lord, uh, it's not a question of feeling. Don't live in your feeling. Live in your will. Exercise your will and say, Lord, I, it doesn't matter if I feel I've forgiven them or not, but in my will I say, I am forgiving them now. God goes by your will, not by your feelings. Please remember that. That was a great liberation for me when I discovered that, that I don't have to live in my feeling. It's not a question of whether I feel something. Lord, my will is set. I have forgiven that person. That's it. I don't want to commit that sin. Okay, I'm going to keep on being tempted, but Lord, my will is set. I don't want to do it. Live in your will. It liberated me. If the feelings are deceptive. So that's the first thing. Confess every known sin, forgive everybody who has hurt you, and ask forgiveness from anyone whom you have hurt that you can remember. Call them up, send an email, or write a letter, or meet the person and say, I'm sorry for the way I treated you, or spoke to you, or I'm really sorry, I want to keep a clear conscience. Give back money that you cheated other people of, like Zacchaeus, with interest. Give it back. And say, Lord, I want to be clear. I want to give to Caesar what is Caesar's before I give to God what is God's. I want to be clear in my heart. I want to have an absolutely clear conscience before God and before men. Then, next step. First is clearing the conscience. Then see if you have opened up every room in your heart to God. I'm telling you how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. First, clean up the cup. You don't pour tea into a dirty cup. That's why I say clean your conscience first. And then, that's why they couldn't have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Everybody's heart was dirty. But now it can be cleansed. And then, see, there are big different compartments in our heart. We love certain things. And we love certain things more than we love Jesus. <laughs> but in that area, the Holy Spirit cannot come. The Holy Spirit will come to every area of your heart where you love Jesus supremely. Lord, I love Jesus more than I love my parents. I love Jesus more than I love money. I love Jesus more than I love my job. I love Jesus more than I love my car. I love Jesus more than I love reading novels or whatever it is. There's nothing wrong in having a car or having a house or caring for your parents or your wife or children. Or, but the moment you love some of those things more than Jesus Christ, that is the area of your heart that's closed. And you can pray for a hundred years to be filled with the Spirit. You love the door. How can He fill you? That's the reason so many Christians are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They lock the door of certain compartments of their heart. Say, oh God, fill me. Don't waste your time. Go to sleep. Don't pray all night. He's not going to hear you. You lock the door. You open the door. Say, so, Lord, come in. I want to love Jesus more than some of those precious TV programs that I watch. Can you give it up for Jesus' sake? Are you willing to give up some program that's not clean, it's not very edifying, but maybe you watched it for years? I'm not against people having television. To me, it's, television is like a library. I don't tell people don't go to the library, but I say, 
be careful what books you take out of the library. TV is like that, and nowadays with computers, that's worse than TV. So how can I tell people to get rid of TV and have a computer? It's a question of attitude. And if you have, are so attached to something that you can't give it up for the sake of Jesus, it's no use asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You have to, the Spirit of God comes to exalt Jesus Christ in every area of your life. He must mean more to you than your job. More to you than, that means in your job you never compromise or tell a lie to get more business or to make more money or to get a promotion. I say no. I had to do that in the Navy. I had to sometimes tell my senior officers, you know, stand at attention and say, sir, I'm a Christian. It's against my conscience to do that. Fine. I don't get the promotion, but I would have got otherwise. It's fine. I'm interested in being promoted by the Lord, not by that man. Make sure there's nothing in your life that you will compromise for the sake of Christ. Examine your life. Say every area. Or you can tell me what DVDs I have in my house that need to be thrown into the trash. What type of music I'm listening to is not glorifying to God. Not what other Christians tell you. And I'm not here to tell you. You sense in your spirit. That type of thing is not helping you. I'm not against secular music. Let me tell you that. Sometimes secular music can be very relaxing. But you young people listening to a lot of these love songs is not going to edify you. It's, it'll damage your mind. Be careful what type of love songs you listen to and rock music. People once ask me, what do you think of Christian rock? I say, that's like asking what do you think of Christian adultery? <laughs> or Christian murder? <laughs> Christian rock? I mean, I can see a place for rock music in the world. Christian rock? I don't understand that. I say, all of our singing must be for to glorify Jesus and to worship the Father, not to entertain people. I don't want them. Entertainment is okay in the world, but Christian music is not meant to entertain. It's meant to, can be a word in that, challenge people, inviting people to come to the Savior or glorifying God. So we got to be very careful about a lot of things in our home and all which you have to see whether things are glorifying to Christ or not. I remember reading a little poem about what would you do if Jesus suddenly came to your house? i never forget that. If Jesus came to your house, I'm sure you'd welcome him at the door and have the best room ready and the best food and all that, but uh, would you have to hide some magazines before he came to your house? Put away some books and uh, decide not to watch your favorite TV program that day because Jesus is there and uh, speak extra kindly to your wife and <laughs> because, <laughs> because Jesus is around <laughs> and a few things like that and, and then after a couple of days when Jesus goes away he says I'm going of course like we would say to all guests oh please don't go we want you to stay and all that but he says I'm going what would you say when he goes and you say, ah, oh, now I can be myself again. <laughs> you don't really want Jesus in your house. <clears throat> Think of it, if Jesus were physically in your house, what would you have to change in your house? Why don't you change it now and ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit? But that is bringing the presence of Jesus into your home. To be filled with the Spirit is to bring the presence of Jesus into your home. It's actually Christ there. You'll never be lonely after that. Because He'll be with you. It's the most wonderful thing to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ is bringing Jesus right into you. He'll give you peaceful sleep at night. Control your dreams, control your conversation, make you upright, deliver you from 
anxieties, fears concerning your children. It's the best atmosphere in which you can bring up your little children in your home. I wanted our boys, we have four boys, I wanted them to grow up to feel that the most wonderful home they could ever build when they got married would be a home like ours. I said, Lord, if they can feel that, we've done our job. And if they can understand the secret of that is to obey God's word, never have anything in the home that dishonors Christ. And be faithful and don't waste money. I don't believe Jesus was extravagant with money. If he earned a little more one day, he didn't just go and spend it. Be very faithful in little things like this. And then go to God and say, Lord, I yield in every area. I want you to fill every part of me with your Holy Spirit. Believe me, it would be like pulling the curtains. When you pull the curtains, you don't have to ask the sunlight to come in. You don't have to ask it. Immediately, the sunlight comes in. It's like that. So, let's do our part. That's powerful love. It's not an emotional thing, being filled with the Spirit. It's very sacred, but not emotional. The Spirit of God can blow like a whirlwind or like a gentle whisper. The wind blows in different ways in different believers. Don't seek for the experience that you heard somebody else have. You are unique before God and God will meet with you in your own way. In his own way for you. But say this, Lord, everything that I've heard today, I really want to respond to, particularly the matter of conscience. To have a clear conscience before God and men. First opportunity, I want to say it all right. And I want to yield every area of my life that not yet yielded. Please help me in the area where I find a reluctance to yield. Please make me willing. Bend my will, Lord, so that it surrender to you. I'm willing for you to bend my will to the will of God. That'll do. If you say you're allowed, willing, willing to let God bend your will to the will of God. He knows where you're weak. He knows the attractions you have. So don't try to fool him. He knows everything. And never justify yourself before him. Don't give him reasons why you do this and why you do that. Forget it. Say, Lord, I want to be yielded to you and I'm willing to pay the price. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that I can build the only thing that's going to remain when everything is destroyed in the Church of Jesus Christ. I want you to give me the gifts that are needed to do that. I don't want to waste my life. Maybe I'm not prepared yet. Maybe I need to be more broken. I'm willing to be broken, Lord. Do whatever it takes and prepare me. And when the time comes, please use me to build your church. I'm available. I'm not able but I'm available. It's all God wants to hear from you. And trust Him. And as you pray those words to Jesus, quietly in your heart, thank Him that He's heard you. And say, Lord, give me an assurance that you really heard me and answered my prayer. And wait on the Lord to get that assurance until then. Thank Him. Keep thanking Him that He heard your prayer. He's a loving Father. He will not deny bread from those who ask for it. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It will change your life. It will lift your life to an altogether higher plane. 
Don't look for manifestations. Look for a more fervent love for Jesus. The Spirit of God will fill your heart with love for Jesus Christ. And love for the unlovely people around you. That's how you know the Spirit of God has come. It's the aroma of Christ's love that will flood your heart. That's how you know. Heavenly Father, I believe there are many sincere, really sincere, brothers and sisters here who want your best and who you want to give your best. I pray in Jesus' name you give them a deep assurance that you've heard their cry. Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. And I know you're moving in their heart and lead them to the place where rivers of living water will flow from them in days to come. Bringing them into that deep rest in God. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.